Underwood and Flinch Written and read by Mike Bennett This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Episode 14 David walked through the kitchen. There was no sign of Anna. Maybe she was off polishing the family knuckle dusters or something. It was hard to believe that the nice little woman he'd been chatting to over toast that morning was complicit in the imprisonment of Gavin. But at the same time, it followed. She was in the sect. She was a servant of Underwood. He was angry with himself for not suspecting the worst from the outset. Lydia, Anna, Conchi. They were all nothing but a band of cutthroats, and he'd been a fool to ever think they were anything less. He looked at his watch. It was 2.15, siesta time. Well, that explained Anna's absence. She was probably off dreaming sweet and bloody dreams of her fanged Prince Charming, which was just as well. He was going to get Gavin out of there, and the fewer objectors there were to that, the better. He stepped outside into the afternoon heat and hurried across the courtyard, past the fountain, to the front of the house. There, on the drive, was Lydia's Land Rover, and beside it, in prime parking position under the trees, was Anna's red hatchback. He glanced around. There had to be another car somewhere. John must have had one. It was impossible to live this far out in the country without a car. Then he remembered the garage. Quickly he walked around to the side of the house, his feet crunching on the hot gravel which grew thinner underfoot the farther he went around the house. As he rounded the back of the building he saw the garage ahead. It was an old white adobe building that had originally been a farm machinery storehouse. The old corrugated tin roof had been replaced with terracotta tiles, and the two front doors looked as though they had recently received a new coat of green paint, but otherwise it looked much the same as he remembered it. One thing that was definitely the same was the padlock and chain that held the doors closed. David tried the lock. It was well oiled and shut tight. Fuck it! The garage had always been out of bounds, and as a boy he'd always accepted that, Never before had he tried to get inside, and, as he reached up and felt along the doorframe, he got the vaguest sense of doing something naughty. Then his fingers touched a small, sun-heated key. He smiled, took it down, and slipped it into the padlock. The lock sprang open, and he removed it before pulling the chain through the door handles. He gathered the lock and chain together, flung them aside, and pulled on the right-hand door. It swung open easily, and warm air, heavy with the scent of engine oil, spilled over him. He looked inside. As his eyes were accustomed to the glare of the sun, the interior of the garage seemed at first to be almost a solid blackness. Then he made out the silver-rimmed headlights, which for a moment appeared like the eyes of a night predator watching him from the darkness. David smiled as the shape of the car before him slowly revealed itself, its sleek lines reflecting the sunlight like the surface of a black liquid. How could he have forgotten the Citroen, the DS that his father used to take them out for drives in when they were kids? Apparently it had been Arthur's retirement gift to himself— he had once told David that Underwood didn't much care for the shark-nosed design of the car, and so he'd had to wait until after Underwood had been interred before he could treat himself to one. David walked over and touched its warm body. His fingers traced lines through a fine coat of dust to reveal an immaculately wax-polished finish beneath. No doubt John had inherited ownership of the car when Arthur died. So whose did that make it now? Was it his? If you think that's impressive, said Lydia from behind him, take a look over there. He turned. She stood silhouetted in the doorway, pointing into the deeper shadows to the left of the garage. 
he followed her finger to the shape of another car. It, too, was black and almost hidden in the darkness. Here, said Lydia, let's shed some light on the old girl. She swung the left door of the garage open, and the sun drove the shadows back to reveal a large vintage hearse. But not just any hearse, David observed. It was a roller. The Silver Lady ornament and double R Rolls-Royce logo shone in the sunlight above the radiator grill and old-fashioned bug-eyed headlights. David stared at the car. Is that... Underwoods? Lydia walked in and stood beside him. Yes, it's a 1947 Rolls-Royce Wraith. Dad used to chauffeur his lordship in it when Underwood was, a. Uh, in repose. David walked over and ran his hands reverently along the bodywork. I'm guessing it's still roadworthy. Oh, yes, it's roadworthy, all right. The maintenance of these cars was another of John's little hobbies. As you know, the Citroen was Dad's car after Underwood was laid to rest. All Dad needed it for was his retirement. But this... She tapped the silver lady on her head. This was in service. Oh, what do you mean by that? Lydia smiled and walked around to the back of the hearse. Our father was a practical man. He made some little adjustments here and there that made this car better suited to his and Underwood's needs. Then John, who was also a practical man, ensured that Dad's adjustments were always as well maintained as any other part of the car. She opened the back door and stepped aside for David to see. David looked in and saw only an empty hearse. What, this is the bit where the coffin goes, right? Yes, nothing unusual. Well, I don't know. I haven't looked inside that many hearses. But it looks as you'd expect it to look. David looked again. The area where the coffin went appeared to be made of smooth, polished chrome. Beneath it was a solid supporting structure, upholstered in black velvet. He shrugged. Yeah? Good. That's precisely what Dad always intended. Lydia bent forward and placed her hands flat and about two feet apart on the black velvet section. She moved her thumbs around slightly for a moment, then she smiled. Here and here. She pushed with her thumbs. There was a click and the black velvet section sprang forward about a centimetre. Lydia reached beneath it and pulled. David stood back as the drawer rolled silently out on smooth runners. When he saw what was inside, his mouth fell open. Oh, my! Lydia looked up at him. It's dead cool, isn't it? In stark contrast to the exterior covering, the interior of the drawer was lined with red velvet. It had been divided into compartments. In one compartment were clothes held down by black elastic fastenings, a pressed black suit, a white shirt, a tie, and a pair of new black socks. Above them, in another compartment, was a pair of polished black shoes, not new, but worn. David looked at Lydia and pointed to the shoes. She simply nodded in reply. David looked back to the drawer. On either side of the clothes, nestled in shapes especially cut to hold them snugly, were two Thompson machine guns. David lifted one out and admired it. Its black metal surface shone dully in the shadows of the garage, and it smelled of warm oil. Oh, man! I used to have a toy one of these when I was a kid. It's good, isn't it? Have you ever fired one before? Well, in the army I fired plenty of guns, but never a Thompson. He felt the weight. The area around the circular magazine felt heavy. It's loaded. Naturally. It wouldn't be much good in an emergency if it weren't, would it? No. No, I suppose not. David raised the gun to his eye and looked along the barrel to the gun sights. It's a real antique, isn't it? What is it? 1930s? 1940s? Oh, how should I know? Maybe John has a little section on them in his notes. 
search under armory. Armory? You mean there's more weapons? Oh, yes, all sorts. If you like killing people, then this is the job for you. It comes with a wide range of death-dealing tools and accessories. David put the Tommy gun back into its place in the drawer. Yeah, well, I don't like killing people. Lydia smiled. I know. What conflict you must be feeling right now. David ignored her. He pointed at the only remaining object in the drawer. A briefcase. What's in the case? Why don't you open it and see? He knelt and popped open the case. It was full of cash. Bundles of euros, British pounds, American dollars and Russian rubles, each in separate sections. David was impressed to see that all the money was current. John had obviously kept an eye on how notes, especially British ones, changed from time to time. Then he noticed the passports, two of them, both UK issue. He took one out and opened it at the picture page. Underwood smiled back at him. The passport was current, though it had to be a forgery, a colour photograph that looked as if it had been cleaned up and colourised from an original black and white version had been digitised and sealed under a skin of plastic. Underwood's face, as always, was unchanged. He wore a shirt and tie, and his hair was short and shone with hair oil. David read the name next to the picture. Underwood, Daniel, William. Born, 1970. He smiled and held it up for Lydia to see. Talk about lying about your age. Yes. Are the other ones John's? I suppose you'd better remove it and replace it with yours now. David said nothing. He closed Underwood's passport and put it back beside John's. The two together, Underwood and Flinch. Now the other passport would be his. He felt a momentary wave of dizziness and closed his eyes. "'What's the matter?' asked Lydia. "'Overcome with emotion? Or did someone just walk over your grave?' David ignored the question and pointed to the clothes. "'Why the clothes?' "'What? John didn't mention the clothes situation in his manual?' "'I don't know,' said David. "'I haven't been researching how to dress him, have I?' So, please, what is the clothes situation? Oh, don't worry, Lydia said as she slid the drawer closed. You'll be able to ask the master in person soon enough. She got up and slammed the back door of the hearse. David smiled thinly. Fine. Well, I won't be taking this motor into town anyway. The last thing I need is to get pulled over with a kidnapped kid and a couple of Tommy guns on board. He went over to the Citroen. This will do me nicely. Lydia sighed and followed him. David, look, I know you're angry and you think you're doing the right thing, but you really haven't thought this through, have you? There's nothing to think through, Lydia. I'm not going to let you murder that boy, and that's all there is to it. So what are you going to do? Take away our only tested and guaranteed clean source of blood? Spend half the remainder of the day driving him to Torremolinos or wherever, and then the other half driving back again? Assuming you even come back at all? Oh, I'll come back. You don't need to worry about that. Oh, sure. No doubt followed by an armada of police. What do you think he's going to do when you drop him off? Leave the sack on his head like the elephant man, counting slowly to a hundred to give you time enough to get away? I'll be careful. I'll drop him somewhere remote. Ish. He'll still take your license plate number, you stupid hippie. Jesus, David, you're living in a dream world. You simply can't do this. Don't you understand? There is no plan B. There has to be. There isn't. Damn it, Lydia! David slammed his hand on the roof of the Citroen. You're talking about murder! Oh, David, come on! You have to get past that notion. Do you think the men who work in slaughterhouses burden their consciences with words like murder? They probably think of the animals they kill as just things on a production line. Which is what they are, really, isn't it? Just things on a food production line? And that's all the boy in the cellar is. Lydia! David pressed his fist against his head. 
It's not the same thing. We can't just murder him. We have to. What else do you suggest we revive Underwood with? Smelling souls? A vampire lives on blood, human blood, and that boy is a source of what? Eight or nine pints? Where else are we going to find that much fresh human blood on a Saturday afternoon, hmm? David shook his head. I don't know. Lydia laid a hand on his shoulder, then said in a gentler tone, Maybe it would help if you try to think of it as taking one life to save another. David shrugged her away and walked out into the sunshine. He looked out across the miles and miles of olive groves that shimmered in the heat, as if the answer to the dilemma might suddenly appear, mirage-like, somewhere among them. Lydia came out and stood beside him. As I said, we don't have a plan B, David. Then we have to come up with one. Lydia sighed. So what do you propose? We bleed Anna to death. There's no one else around. David frowned. He turned to her. Bleed Anna? <laughs> well, no, I'm joking, obviously. No, said David. No, no, you might have something there. I thought about it earlier on, but I dismissed it because I, I didn't think it was what John was getting at. But, but now that I know what John was actually getting at... I'm suddenly thinking, why not? Bleed Anna to death? No, no, not to death, just a little. We take a pint. No more than they take in a blood donor clinic. <laughs> and then what? Sit her down with a cup of tea and a biscuit? Are you mad? No. David was suddenly excited. Think about it. It doesn't even have to be Anna. It can be any of us. You, me. Uh, no flinch shall bleed said Lydia. All right, so not one of us. But what about all these sect people you've got coming? Surely they'd be happy to sacrifice a pint of their blood in order to raise their master. Lydia's top lip curled in contempt. You can't be serious. You want to bleed our guests. It's not exactly good manners, is it? Not all of them. We won't need to. We'd only need one or two pints to do the job, if that even. See, the stomach is a very sensitive thing. After a long period of disuse, it can't take too much of anything. And fifty years is a, is a very long period of disuse. So my guess is, all Underwood will actually be able to digest is a couple of mouthfuls. Lydia waved a hand. Oh, boo. Why are we told to bleed a whole person's worth of blood if all we need is a couple of mouthfuls? because that's probably what they always used to do. They'd grab a victim, Underwood would take what he needed in terms of blood, and then they'd just kill him, regardless of the amount needed or taken. Lydia shook her head. I don't like the sound of this. It's not what Underwood wants at all. What he has to adapt, Lydia. You said so yourself. He's not waking up in 1958, is he? No, but... But nothing. Work with me on this, will you? Who could we use to start with? You're serious? He nodded. You're seriously suggesting we bleed our guests, the sect members? Well, it may not even come to that. We can probably get by with staff and trusted friends. Anna is one, Conchie's another. Who else? Humour me. Who'd be up for it, in theory? Lydia shrugged. Well, there's Beltran, of course, Dr. Morales. He's a masochist, amongst other things. He'd do it at the drop of a hat. A doctor? Yes, he runs a sexual health clinic in Malaga. He's the one who screened Gavin's blood for us. Can he get medical supplies? Get them? Oh, the man's apartment is positively awash with them. It's a fetish of his. He's quite incorrigible. Oh, yes, yes. Lydia, this is it. This is our plan B. Oh, dear. David touched his temples, as if trying to further coax Plan B by stimulating them. This doctor friend of yours, could he bring us the stuff we'd need for a blood transfusion? Lydia shook her head. David, this isn't a plan, it's an arse on a stick. No, this will work! We raise Underwood and no one gets her! 
There'll be no corpses, no cops, no trail of death and destruction. It's brilliant. It's deranged. Answer me. Can Dr. Morales get blood transfusion equipment? I imagine so. Okay, call him now and ask him to bring it out here, along with anything else he thinks we could use. David. Oh, and don't forget to ask if he'd be willing to donate a pint personally. Underwood won't like this. I'll take that risk, Lydia. I'm the Guardian and it's my call. If he doesn't like it, don't worry, I'll take full responsibility. And so what are we going to do about the boy, Gavin? Uh, David's mind was racing. I don't know. He'll be okay for now. I mean, we can leave him here for another night. You're right. Dropping him in broad daylight, especially today, well, it just isn't practical. I can take him tomorrow morning. Well, that's something, at least. He can be on standby in the event that you finally come to your senses. David turned to her, his eyes bright. Oh, I've come to my senses, Lydia. Don't you see? You were right when you said that society had evolved and Underwood has to evolve with it. And this, this is a key part of that evolution. Uh, what is? You've lost me. David took her by the arms. It's this. No one has to die. Not tonight, not ever. The vampire is going to evolve, and we shall be the architects of his evolution, Lydia. Using science and practical methods of blood transference, we can ensure that Underwood need never kill anyone ever again. Lydia was silent for a moment. Then she said, You know, that's... Possibly the weirdest idea I've ever heard. But it's possible, isn't it? Well, yes, I suppose it's possible, but... No buts. It's possible, and that's enough. David, can you hear yourself? You sound like Victor Frankenstein. David smiled. Ah, but Frankenstein was a genius. Frankenstein was a nut. Come on, said David. We have to get cracking. He turned and strode off towards the house. Lydia watched him go. To herself, she murmured, Get cracking. She shook her head and started slowly after him. Brother dear, you've already cracked. Nigel Hodge, Hodgekiss, sat at a table in Bar Pepe Mendes with a glass of Cruz Campo beer and a tapas portion of green olives. He was reading a novel written in basic Spanish intended for learners of the language. On a previous reading of the book, he'd made copious notes in the page margins explaining what, for him at the time, had been new words. Many of these words were now in his active Spanish vocabulary, but not all. Hodge popped another olive into his mouth and stared in utter bewilderment at a phrase he'd evidently once been quite familiar with, since he hadn't made any notes about it, but had now completely forgotten. Estoy agotada, he murmured, hoping that maybe the sound of the words might jump-start his memory. It didn't. He looked over to the bar. A couple of local men were engaged in lively discussion about something mysterious— Hodge couldn't follow a word of it. For a second he considered going over and asking them what Estoy Agotada meant. But even if they explained it to him, Hodge wouldn't be able to understand their explanations. It was for this reason that Hodge sat at a table rather than at the bar. People always spoke to him when he sat at the bar, and try as he might, he could never understand a word they were saying. He'd come out to Spain in 2002 with his then-girlfriend, Sharon, and they'd rented an apartment in Benidorm together. He'd got a job at Keith's pub, and Sharon had tried to find work as a beauty technician. Nails were her speciality. Unfortunately, none of the English-speaking salons needed a nail technician, and Sharon couldn't speak a word of Spanish, not even nails. So she'd abandoned her job quest, uh, being the selective professional that she was, and sat around on the beach, waiting for a suitable position to become available. They split up three months later. Sharon returned to England, and Hodge stayed on at the John Bull Tavern. Hodge loved Spain. He loved everything about it. But the one thing that had always proved an insurmountable obstacle for him was the language. 
or more specifically the Andalusian pronunciation of it. He'd been studying Spanish for years. The bookshelves of his apartment were bowing with the weight of dictionaries and textbooks, CDs and cassettes. But these recordings were all invariably made by speakers of Castilian Spanish from the north of the country. On the cassettes, they always spoke very clearly, and Hodge could always rewind anything he didn't catch the first time. However, here in Andalusia, the pronunciation sounded completely different. Andalusian Spanish was famously hard to grasp, even for northern Spaniards, who had told Hodge that in Andalusia, people eat the endings of their words. He'd found that to be true, especially inland, here in Almacena. Here they ate not only the endings, but seemingly as much of the word as they could. Or at least, that's how it sounded to Hodge. He closed his eyes and strained to understand the flow of the conversation at the bar, trying to glean a flash of meaning from a word or phrase. How's it going? The voice wasn't Spanish, but Dublin Irish. Hodge opened his eyes as Damo Sullivan pulled out the chair opposite him and sat down. All right, mate, said Hodge. Here, what does estoy agotada mean? I'm knackered, said Damo. Well, yeah, sure you are. Uh, but what does estoy agotada mean? It means I'm knackered. Oh, bugger. Hodge rolled his eyes at his own stupidity. Of course it is. Agata, to exhaust. Oh, how could I forget that? Maybe because you're never knackered enough to need to use it. I get knackered often enough. Hell, what do you do to snackering? I go running sometimes. That's snackering, especially in this heat. Yeah, well, you're not going to go up to a Spanish person all puffing and panting with a face like a wet turnip and say, Estoy agotada now, are you? Oh, well, no. Well, that's what you've forgotten it then, isn't it? If you don't use it, you lose it. So, what's the story? What do you want to see me about? I can't wait until tonight. It's about Mark Coleman. What about him? Haven't you heard? No. Heard what? He's dead. Dead? Oh, no, the fucking Egypt. What was it? Smack? I knew he'd get into that one day. Oh, no. It was blooming murdered. Damo's mouth was open, ready to receive an olive. He dropped the olive, but his mouth stayed open. Fuck off. It's true. And do you have to say fuck off when you mean I don't believe it? It's not very nice. All right, but I don't fucking believe it. Well, like I said, it's true. Damo picked up another olive and popped it into his mouth. How? Someone cut his head off. Get away, you fucking shit me. Hodge shook his head. I wish I was, mate. Did he cut his head off? What with? I don't know. The paper didn't say. Fucking hell. Do you want a beer? Yeah. Hodge raised his hand and gestured to the barman. Uh, dos cervezas, por favor. The barman nodded and Hodge turned back to Damo. Did he know why? Damo asked. Why he was murdered? No, not that they're saying anyway, but I reckon it was them Russians. What? The Russians in Benidorm? Yeah, of course the Russians in Benidorm. How many other Russians was Coleman involved with? How do I know? He was a dealer. He might have known loads of Russians. All right, well, let me rephrase that. How many Russian mafia types nephews was Coleman involved in murdering? Damo shrank down in his seat. Shut the fuck up, H. He whispered urgently. You never know who can speak English in these places. Oh, yes, I bloody do. You and me and no bugger else. <laughs> More's the pity. You don't know that. The barman speaks of it. Yeah, he knows Allo and Manchester United. But I don't reckon he knows murdering somehow. He might do. It's on the telly a lot. Well, let's find out, shall we? Hodge turned to the barman, who was approaching with their drinks. The barman set the drinks down. Gracias and murder said Hodge. De nada, said the barman with a smile. He turned and walked away. See, we could be discussing plans to put a bomb under King Juan Carlos's bed and no one would be any the wiser. Damo shook his head. Ah, bollocks, mate. You gotta be careful at all times because you never know who can understand you. It's that fucking simple. Oh, good. So, uh, I can take it then that you've been careful at all times? Damo took a sip of his beer. What do you mean? I mean, you haven't told any of our old associates where we are. What? Why the fuck would I do that? 
Well, not intentionally, sure, but, you know, maybe by accident, when you're out clubbing or something down on the coast. What? Are you fucking mental? Here's me telling you to be careful with your gob, because you're not. And now you're asking me if I am. Me? I'm the fucking soul of discretion, I am. Not like you with your big flapping cake hole. Well, what about when you're all loved up? Damo was aghast. Do I look fucking stupid or something? Have I got a track record of being a fucking idiot that I'm unaware of? No, but, you know, you've got a track record for taking the kind of chemicals that loosen lips and sphincters. D- what are you going on about sphincters for? Are you saying I take it up the arse? The men at the bar looked over. Damo grinned at them amicably. El football es la vida. The men chuckled and went back to their conversation. Look, mate, said Hodge in a lower tone, I'm not accusing you of being a canary or a queen. I'm just asking if you might have said anything to anyone. We need to be sure. It fucking sounds like you're accusing Hodge. But for the record, no, I've said bugger all. Jesus, I got to say, I'm a bit fucking hurt. Oh, come on, mate. You know I don't actually think you'd say anything stupid. Well, I just wanted to check is all. Well, now you know. So, you can apologise. Hodge sighed. Oh, come on. Apologise, please. First you tell me that a dear friend of ours is dead. And then, when I'm all in shock, you accuse me of being an idle gossip with a slack arsehole. Seriously, I am. I'm hurt. All right. I'm sorry. I should fucking think so. Hodge looked into his drink a moment. So, what do you reckon, then? You think it was Sergei's mob what's done him in? Oh, yeah. Damo nodded and finished his drink. Defo, we're in big fucking trouble. The men at the bar laughed. Damo and Hodge looked over at the men and then back to each other. See? said Damo, tapping the side of his nose. I reckon they understood that all right. Thank you for listening to Underwood and Flinch. At the time of me posting this episode, the podcast is incomplete here at YouTube. More episodes will be added in time. If the next episode has been uploaded, you'll see a link to it on your screen in a moment. But if it's not, don't despair. The podcast is complete, along with seasons two and three, with a fourth in progress at the time of recording this, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links in the description below. Thank you.